The world created a record 2.2 billion tonnes of waste in 2021. By 2050, that figure may nearly double. The world is, in short, not dealing well with its waste problem. So what can consumers, governments and companies do to make the world less rubbish? Turning pollutions into a life-saving solution. And could a zero-waste planet become a reality? This man helped build wards for COVID-19 patients in 2021. What's unusual is that Arthur Huang built them out of trash. Here we are turning uh, local waste from recycled aluminum, recycled polypropylene, recycled PET from the medical waste system. And we're turning that into a medical war system for the pandemic. Instead of bricks and cement, the walls of these modular wards were put together from recycled materials. What we have created is a series of Lego blocks. And once you click together, the building can be built in 24 hours. Arthur is the inventive engineer behind MiniWiz. He says his company is showing that it's possible to make money out of solving the world's waste problem by turning local trash into cash. Uh, you want to source your material as close to where the building construction is happening. So that right away, you save just on managing your supply chain within the close proximity. MiniWiz focuses on buildings because not only is construction the most material intensive industry in the world, consuming 42 billion tons of resources annually, it also produces about one third of all global waste. Why we focus on building is because there is a scale match between trash, how much trash we produce, and how much material we use in buildings. Arthur believes that one of the keys to reducing global waste is upcycling, creating additional value out of waste products. So uh, a simple one that everyone talk about is upcycling of PET bottles into yarns, into your jerseys, into the shirt, for example, into my shoes, for example. Why is that called upcycling? It's because the inherent value of a packaging is less than the second life it produces. But upcycling will only be embraced globally if more examples like this can be found, ones that make business as well as environmental sense. To show the potential of upcycling, MiniWiz's latest project turned an old bank into new offices. Uh, everything you see from the ceiling, made from recycled polyester and recycled linen fiber, all the way to the brick, made from recycled semiconductor casing in the production process, all the way to uh, the sofa pillows made from recycled polyester, which is from a plastic bottle. Even the old neckties of the bankers were upcycled into artwork. We're using our old tie from Dutch Securities in the uh, document case, and I think this is a leftover of our ceiling. seating panels. Yeah, it looks like a Chinese painting, actually. Yeah, but it's actually using a machine, it's just like doing this. Arthur argues that traditional recycling is a waste of time because it demands resources, doesn't add value, and usually just delays the material ending up in waste. I want to recycle a plastic bottle, a single use, back into a single use. That, to me, is called downcycling. But some experts caution against placing too much faith in recycling or upcycling. I think in terms of looking at how we manage waste, we need to remove this idea of a silver bullet altogether. There is no single technical solution that is going to fix everything. There is a trend globally that we are producing too much waste in contrast to how quickly we are managing it and finding alternative methods and uses for our waste. One of the challenges is that comparatively little waste ends up being recycled. Currently, 37% of solid waste goes to landfill worldwide, 33% to open dumps, 11% to incinerators. All told, only 14% of municipal solid waste is recycled globally. Improving this 
will depend on expanding what's known as the circular economy, based on the principle of reduce, reuse, recycle. The traditional linear economy is built on the premise of take, make, dispose. And it's this approach which still dominates the world. Only 8.6% of the global economy is circular. And expanding it will require the rest of the world to follow the surprising lead of a country once known as Garbage Island. Taiwan is now the golden child globally in terms of circular economy and waste management. Here in Taiwan, they've even built a monument to recycling. This cultural space, known as the Eco Arc Pavilion, has become a symbol of how to bin throwaway culture. The Taiwanese people gave 1.5 million plastic bottles to help build it. So how did Taiwan manage to get from this? This island of 20 million people is literally overflowing with rubbish. To this. The story starts in the 1990s, when Taiwan faced a familiar problem. The richer it got, the more stuff it chucked away. Like much of Asia, Taiwan experienced a really booming economy. And with that came more spending, more buying of products, um, improvements to quality of life, but also increases in waste. Already 95% of its 200 landfill sites are full. Since then, Taiwan's government has used planning and data to create one of the most advanced integrated waste management systems in the developed world. By law, large companies, accounting for 80% of industrial waste, have to log and report the materials they use and the waste they generate. This is novel in that it's now a web application. You and I can look at this database and see a comprehensive flow of materials that includes advanced modeling to show us graphics of different resources and different industries. There are government incentives for companies to reduce waste and penalties if they don't. And the buck doesn't stop there. Citizens are not allowed to let their trash touch the street. And you can even be paid for reporting those who mess with the law. You can get a reward for um, ratting out your neighbor for doing bad environmental behavior. Taiwan has become a global poster child for recycling, recovering 55% of rubbish collected from households. By contrast, America recycles 35%, and Russia, just 5 to 7%. But Taiwan's clean streets do also hide something of a dirty secret. Virtually all the rubbish, which is not recycled, is incinerated. And while Taiwan's incinerators are comparatively clean, they still dump carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. One of the very interesting facts about Taiwan is it has the highest density of trash burning plant. We have zero landfill policies. So yes, Taiwan become not a trash island, but because now we're just pumping trash into the air. Rich countries create the majority of the world's waste. And it's the sheer volume that encourages the use of incineration in places like Edmonton in North London. We treat about a quarter of London's waste. It's around 500,000 tonnes a year, 10,000 tonnes a week. If you think about that, that 50,000 double-decker buses worth of waste per year coming to this facility from the people of North London. And for some who work in waste management, sites such as this are a reminder that consuming less is central to reducing global waste. The first time I saw this, I wanted to reduce my impact and the amount of waste that was coming into here. The sheer volume of waste and a witness to being burned in his professional life persuaded him to change his personal one completely. I had a, I could say, like, a light bulb moment, I saw the sheer quantity of waste. Taking a data-led approach to his consumption habits, he's embraced what's called the zero waste movement. And this is the end product. So this is 
the entire waste that I produce in one month in, in a jar. The top, bottle wine top, tops, you can recycle that. Over a year, the average London house produces 536 kilograms of waste. By reducing his consumption, Ander produced just 5.7 kilos per year. That's 99% less than average. Limiting the amount of waste that I was putting out um, and making it visible to me that was actually quite important. Making waste visible, uh, it makes you realise how much more waste you produce and I went quite the extra mile to go up to that point. Zero waste remains a niche movement globally, but there are encouraging signs that consumers are grasping the need to consume less. A report found that six out of 10 people across 28 rich countries would be willing to change their shopping habits to reduce environmental impact. Hi, Adrian. <laughs> okay, thank you. How are you? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. How are you? Good. Yes. And ethical zero waste shops offering refills reflect this trend. We helped in a year our customers reduce about 10,000 plastic containers. But reducing the world's waste will also require new technologies to improve the recovery of valuable materials from their waste stream and to improve their repurposing for the benefit of consumers. Back in Taiwan, Arthur has designed this mobile trash press. It uses artificial intelligence to separate different materials, which can be shredded and later used to make new products. For example, the mask. It has a specific material, it has a material property. It's being recorded by the AI machines. Uh, through this trash press process, you can turn a mask into a phone charger uh, with no secondary pollution and it become a wireless charger. It's not just the environmental conscience of consumers which will be needed to expand the circular economy. This new economy will need to create everyday products which consumers think of as first choice rather than second hand. The chair I'm sitting in is made from all jeans. Yeah? You don't want to make um, a sustainable uh, or circular economy a uh, theoretical topic. You want that to be an everyday topic, a lifestyle decision. You wear sunglasses. This is made from rice husk, and this is also made from recycled cigarette butts. Recycling, upcycling is always a bit, it can be a bit enough, but when, when you turn something like this, and it's, it makes it a lot more interesting. Even in Taiwan, Many consumers are yet to be convinced by the circular economy. A more sustainable future can be built by finding better and more integrated ways to manage waste across the world. But there is work to do before this global mess is cleaned up. In terms of really changing how society views making, producing and managing waste, how we view products and the waste that they create, I think those changes are generational. Thanks for watching. I'm Tom Standage, Deputy Editor of The Economist. If you'd like to find out more about a zero waste world, please click on the link and don't forget to subscribe.